Well, I want to welcome everybody to dig in. Bilasi, bienvenue. I'm Robert Cervelli. I'm the executive director of Center for Local Prosperity. So a little bit about who we are. For the next few days, you're going to meet delegates from all four Atlantic provinces, as well as Ontario and the, pro and the territory of Nunavut um, and the U.S. And it's representing all three levels of government, federal, provincial, and municipal across a range of departments. We have academic researchers, producers, fishers, farmers, food processors, food hubs, distributors, retailers, restaurateurs, market managers, schools, First Nation, and other community groups key nonprofit organizations, foundations, and food-related associations. Quite a crowd. We have 45 speakers from across Atlantic Canada, <clears throat> Western Canada, and the US. These speakers represent all aspects of our food systems. They were chosen because their stories are inspirational. Their stories can also be uh, replicated, scaled, or leveraged. Their work points the way towards a more robust regional food system. There are, of course, many other great stories in our region, and we know that many of you are in this room. We know that you're going to increase the value of this summit with all the networking that will occur. So this is not just a summit, this is a food summit, and it's about local food as you just tasted. So we've gone out and we've sourced local food from 24 different vendors. Because it's important to bring visibility to their products. And personally, I love the old saying, that in a perfect food system, you know who grew your food. So that's what we're doing here. So it goes without saying that food, that our work in food is critical, especially in this age of increased global fragility, resource and input scarcity, supply chain disruptions and energy cost increases. Food is becoming more costly around the world. And increasingly in some places, food is becoming scarce. We're coming into an era in human history that we can no longer take our food supply for granted. We cannot take the availability, the choice, or the affordability of our food for granted. We are in an era that requires greater local agency and engagement in our food systems. And you're gonna hear a lot of people speak about that. Like other regions around the world, we're here to create a more robust regional system and the regionality is an important part of the whole thing. That's why we're doing all of Atlantic Canada. And it's one that is also a buff buffered against the future changes to come. It's one that enshrines the right to food and the right to support small and local producers. And one in which policymakers are helping to build local economic reliance. So we're retaking agency for what we eat at the personal level, community and regional levels. We're planting the seeds and cultivating the next food system for our region. <clears throat> so I wanna quote Helen North, Northberg Hodge, the rapidly growing local food movement is about a return to small scale biodiverse farming. It's about community, collaboration, mutual aid, and place-based networks of reciprocity and interdependence. It's about reinstilling our food systems with the principles of reverence and respect for nature that were the hallmarks of indigenous cultures everywhere. So I wanna use that quote as a segue. We're here in DeBert, Nova Scotia, which is a uh, deeply respected archeological heritage site for McMoggy. 
And um, we're glad to be able to have the summit in this location. So in order to properly begin the summit, we have the distinct honor of having Elder Joseph Michael. He's gonna conduct a smudge and an opening prayer. He's a much loved spiritual elder from Indian Brook First Nation, Spakanakadi, which means where the wild potatoes grow. How appropriate. Joe Mike, as everybody calls him, is a pipe carrier and a maker of customized talking sticks that can be found worldwide. He was with the RCMP for many years with when restorative justice was beginning to take root. He's an elder in residence at Mount St. Vincent University and Acadia University. Please welcome Joe Mike. I gotta get him updated a little bit there. Uh, I'm, I'm full-time residence at Acadia University and the, uh, it's, it's really nice down there. It's one of the oldest universities and, and they really entrenched the, uh, our culture. They're very open. And uh, the students are really from across Canada. And they really wanted to absorb our culture. So they're very, it's like the group right here. As Robert said, he came all directions. Part of the smudging, it's gonna be very, not, not intense, but it's gonna be very uh, special because we all travel in four different directions. Whether you, whether you go this direction, east, south, north, or west, but you came from far away to be here. Food is such an important commodity and nourishment that we live by day, by night. Feed your children. And sometimes, and, and the unfortunate ones too, the ones that don't have homes, the ones that cannot ac accessible for food. But just be kind of, hearted people out there that have food kitchens and peace where they could eat. Don't look upon, don't look down on them. It's just a way of life they choose. Pray for them, hope they get their life together and eventually they will. find balance in their lives. And part of that is why we're all here tonight. Giving thanks for our people. When we share, we share as Mi'kmaq people. Everybody in this room are all sharing ideas, thoughts, the past, present and the future. So when I do the opening prayers smudging, I'll ask Donna to come up here, please. She's gonna help me. She's gonna be, uh, she's gonna be my helper tonight. And this is gonna be, uh, I kind of cut her off surprise here. Just matches your, <laughs> just matches your light to say. What, what you're doing now is, is uh, preparing the smudge bowl. The smudge bowl is very important. It's, I find what we've been talking about while we're having supper, appropriation has somehow taken over our culture, our ceremonies, our rituals. And a lot of this is bad. It's just bad medicine. It's just like bad food, poison. When you eat something that you shouldn't be eating, it's gonna affect your body. 
And that's poison. So you don't want to eat nothing. Well, anyway, I do, because the expiry date on it, two years, that's good enough, you know. <laughs> Nuke it, it'll burn it. But but that's something that we had to be careful. We, we poison our minds sometimes, and, and they do, they, they, they're out there. So be careful when, when you uh, invite elders in the Brown State PEI or way up north or whatever, uh, check them out, you know, check them out. There's always First Nation community or Inuit or any settlement. Prevent the appropriation from happening. You know, it's like everything else, frozen food, toss out, you don't freeze it over again. But I mean, you guys all know about that. <laughs> Are you ready? Just observe her when I'm, what you're going to be doing. She's be clearing them, mind, her eyes, ears, mouth, heart, and arm. East is this way? Where's the sun come up? This way? Where's the sun come up? East? This way? Let me get out my compass. <laughs> I, 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 I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Wait. We stand? Thank you. And when I turn, you, you, you guys turn too. Wait. We ask our grandfathers. Our grandmothers and all our family members that were in the spirit world come into our circle tonight. As you wish for your wisdom throughout this conference, we look for your guidance in how we move forward. We give thanks to all of our family members that are here. We pray for their long life happiness, but we must pray for their family members as they're here for protection, for the safe. And these ones are here traveling for a safe journey when it's all over. We give thanks to the creator and all the spirits. Wait. We call upon our ancestors, our grandfathers, grandmothers, all our families, our parents, brothers and sisters who are in the spirit world, come into our circle. As you whisper your wisdom and kindness in how we should be taught, how should we should learn and respect our food. But we give special prayers to those who cannot obtain all these gifts. We pray for their health. Who are addicted. We ask the Creator to guide them in the right direction. We, we call upon our ancestors, our grandfathers, grandmothers, and you, Creator, come into our circle, all our ancestors who are in the spirit world. We give thanks for the kind offerings, the meals that were prepared by the cook, which is lovely. As tomorrow, the spirit plate will be offered. Listen to the words of those offerings to the spirits. If not for you, our society will be in chaos. We listen to the words from the elders and the people that are, know what's taking place, but they come from the wisdom of the elders and the spirit people. We give thanks to the creator, all of abundance. It, we, 
as we smite the four directions, call upon our grandfathers, our grandmothers, all our family members who are in the spirit world to give thanks for this gathering and all the people that are volunteered. We ask for special prayers for these people and the people that prepared the food. We ask the creator to protect these fine people and also help in their safety as their journey begins in this world. We'll be called upon you again, but right now we are honored that you enter this room as you whisper your knowledge to everybody here. We give thanks to you. I know that some people want to be smudged. I could do that after. 
and I think that that would be really appropriate if you if you want to, and I, and I really welcome that. Symbolically, everyone was smiles because I, I made that circle around the room. And when I made that circle around the room, I felt good energy. The spirits of your ancestors, not only mine, the big mom, but your ancestors. They have a lot of recipes, traditional. Just kind of listen to them. They'll speak. With that, I want to welcome everybody to this podium and that to look forward. I'd like to thank Robert and Don for inviting me. I've seen a lot of friends here that I haven't seen for a long time. I, I asked Robert to bring my Nobel Prize from Thinker's Lodge and you forgot it again. <laughs> That's okay. So, so I end up end up with a doctor's degree, whatever you know. But anyway, thank you, Walavin. And um, the thing I have to say, and it'll make sense after a while. Now I know what he said. When you have greater commitment in what you're doing, you'll find that you'll have more time for yourself. The greater the commitment. you'll find out you'll have lots of time for yourself, for your family, partners, whoever. So when you make a commitment, you will find lots of time. But that will long, thank you, and let the party start. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think that was worth the Nobel Prize. <laughs> Uh, before we get underway with our keynote, I do want to thank, um, firstly, our, if this works, oh, look at that, doesn't work. Well, time delay. Oh, we're getting there. This is strange trying to do this as a time delay. I do want to thank our organizing team. We started planning this two years ago. We've been meeting regularly for, um, hopefully it'll stay put. Here's our organizing team. We've been meeting regularly for uh, at least a year and a half. Um, and it's been fantastic to have uh, representation from a lot of uh, groups all across the region. Um, and I also um, want to thank, if I can get this right, um, our sponsors, which doing an event like this, you can't really do without your sponsors. Um, so I would like to give special thanks to Olnawig, uh, the economic development and community development arm um, across McMoggy uh, for sponsoring our indigenous feast tomorrow night. And I make one, I want to make a call out to the Medivy Foundation for their generous support as well uh, for putting this on. But I'd also like to thank CBDC, the provinces of Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and PEI, and our numerous other sponsors that saw a good thing and really wanted to step up. I also want to call out to the United Way that helped with some sponsorships and also the province of Nova Scotia um, for some of the registrants uh, that couldn't afford to be here and, and can otherwise. 
Um, last but not least, a thank you to Taste of Nova Scotia that donated three gift baskets. You'll see them on the raffle table by the registration desk. Fantastic looking contents in there. Of course, it's all food products uh, from Nova Scotia. We are raffling those off and it's cash only for the tickets. So if you brought a debit or credit card, it's not gonna do you any good to, uh, for the raffle. Um, I also wanna mention um, that uh, if you haven't picked one up yet, uh, go to the registration desk, an absolutely fantastic keychain with the Dig In logo. It's your own personal pocket shovel. Uh, and um, those were generously donated by John and Bonnie, Basic Spirit Pewter. So get, make sure you have one before you leave. So a few housekeeping items to keep in mind. The Wi-Fi passwords are posted. I noticed many of you were photographing them at the registration desk. We have a hashtag of dig in. We are live streaming and recording the plenary sessions. Um, so please avoid walking in front of cameras that you might see and remember to mute your phones. This is a no smoking facility, so please step outside. We also want to keep everybody happy and healthy. So if you're not feeling well, there are rapid test kits at the registration desk. And please take advantage of those and of course face masks as well. The exhibitor tables are behind the screen, this direction, or you can also access it down this hallway in that direction. And also, we have our graphic recordist, Julia Feldham. There she is. A definitely a work in pro, not, not you, Julia, but what you're working on. <laughs> so keep an eye on that. It's going to continue to progress. And I have to say, it's the first time I've seen a carpenter's belt being used in this way. That's great. So at this point, I would like to introduce Leanne Prescott, who is here somewhere. Come, come on up. She is with Food for All New Brunswick, one of our organizing team, and she's going to be introducing our keynote speaker for the evening. Hello. Philip Ackerman Least is a free range ed educator who runs Food, Food Shed Solutions LLC from his home in Pollitt, Vermont. He is also the director of ecological benefits and leads the Meat OS Activator at the Lexicon. A food systems and sustainability expert, researcher, academic, and farmer specializing in American milking Devon cattle. His three books, A Precautionary Tale, How One Small Town Banned Pesticides Preserved Its Food Heritage and Inspired a Movement, Rebuilding the Food Shed, and Up Tunket Road, The Education of a Modern Homesteader. Previously, Philip spent two decades as professor of sustainable agriculture and food systems at Green Mountain College, where he built the nation's first online graduate program in food systems and undergraduate program in sustainable agriculture and food systems and a 23 acre organic farm. He then served as Dean of Professional Studies and Director of New American Farmstead and Ster and Sterling at Sterling College. He lives on his family off-grid home off-grid homestead with his wife Erin and three increasingly, I love this, free-range children in Paulette, Vermont. Welcome, Philip Ackerman Least. Uh, thanks so much, Leanne, and thanks to 
Bob and Jillian and Joe and Andrea and the folks who helped make this happen. And you all have to be one of the most organized uh, groups that I know because we've been talking, I think, for at least six months now. <laughs> and it's been wonderful. And, um, you know, always beginning to learn things, you know, about new parts of the world, as I hope you'll see here, um, but a lot to learn from you all this weekend. So. Um, you know, I'm, I'm here as much as anything, uh, probably I, 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 in so many ways, I don't consider my, myself an expert, maybe more a deep listener and someone who also is privileged enough to be able to carry forward some stories from various places. So that's what I hope I'm able to, to do for you this evening. And, um, and Joe, Mike, thank you so much for that ceremony. Um, I think one of the things that in this work of food systems that that we forget so often is it's not just about sustaining ourselves nutritionally. This work is hard. This work is enduring. This work demands vigilance. This basically what we're doing is at least I would say in the United States, we're basically in one generation trying to rebuild what was taken apart very strategically over about three generations. You'll have to inform me over the weekend as to how that's happened here, here um, so that I've got a better understanding of that. But I've watched that and I'd like to tell you a little bit of that story. So it is, we have to have, it's something beyond inner fortitude. It's beyond something that we do as individuals. It's somehow we sustain each other in the process of this. So you know, really meaningful to start out that way. So thank you so much. And the history of traditions. And as you all have, have shown and demonstrated, really recognizing you know, so many of these issues that are critical that I hope we can hit on here as we go. And I've got a lot to share with you. Bob asked me to share some stories from around the world and um, you know, I'm trying to do that in a highly graphic fashion here and um, we'll hope that I can move along with the advance button okay. All right, so as we began talking about this um, and one of the things that I've been thinking about quite a bit uh, lately is you know, um, you know we, we think about so much right-sizing our food system, but very often uh, we tend to forget in the process that it also needs to be right and just. So how do we do that? And that's a little bit of what I'd like to explore and how various um, places have tried to do that in my experience. And one thing I'd like to say too, the Atlantic Canadian Food Systems and the Vision for Recovery, if you haven't, hope you have seen that. Um, I read through it with great interest and I tried to hit on almost every point here um, in some form or fashion. So, you know, I'm not gonna do a ding when I hit one of those 10 items, but, um, you know, you can do that if you want to. I almost brought a bell, but I thought that's a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> So, so much of food systems, I, I think, you know, begins with maps. And good things happen with maps, bad things happen with maps. I think we understand that they're not, sometimes they're highly useful, sometimes they're means of appropriation. Um, so, you know, I'm sensitive to that topic. And in writing Rebuilding the Food Shed, uh, I don't know why I wrote the introduction last, but I did. And um, as I was writing the introduction, I was searching around the internet, trying to think, you know, how do I cast all of this? And I came upon this map. This map is from uh, 1921. It was put out by the Armour Meatpacking Plant. It was sent all across the United States. It was put in post offices, libraries, public schools. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. It tells a tale. It tells a tale of what was going to happen. It tells a tale of concentration and consolidation in the making in the 1920s in the United States. And so this notion, the greatness of the United States, I realized last night, crap, that's not making America great again. That is not what we're trying to do here. And I think I'll make that obvious here pretty soon. Uh, you know, but, but this, is, this is where so much of it began, at least in the, the sense of this metaphorical map, which was very real. There you go, armor, meatpacking plant, Chicago, refrigerated rail cars started out with ice, began to move to mechanical refrigeration. Also, there, um, uh, um, there are also some other byproducts that were coming. Dial soap was coming out of the armor meatpacking plant, lots of other things. This is when so much began to happen in the United States, and I'm afraid it's been a bit of a contagion factor in various parts of the world, um, which I don't care much for. But this gives you the context. This is another brochure I found after that, which I think also says a lot. This is uh, put out by the Armour um, Meatpacking Corporation, and it just says so much. Consumer, livestock, producer. 
So there it is, 100 years we've been depending upon all of these different entities to be the bridge between the consumer and the livestock producer. Um, and so as a result, we know where we are in many cases. And in the United States right now, the latest figures are that on the US dollar, you know, farmers are getting about 13.6 cents on the dollar in the United States. And so this is what happens. You know, the, the income gets diluted as we go and the system is diluted as we go. So here's the irony. And you know, you can play with these figures. You can consider them to be suspect. But basically what it is, uh, it tells about the externalities, the cost of our food systems worldwide. The externalities are $12 trillion by this estimate. The global food system itself is $10 trillion. How did we get so far off the mark that the externalities actually outweigh what's happening in terms of the global food system? And part of what I really like about this study, and nothing is perfect, I mean, go ahead, switch around $500 billion any way you want to and see where you come out. It's still not coming out very good. And so we can look at health, we can look at environment, we can look at the economic um, aspects and the basically the food system value net of the hidden cost. Um, and so you can start to get an idea. In the United States, you know, that greatness piece is, has failed us. We're at the point now where more than 50% of all Americans in the United States have one or more chronic diseases that are food related. 42% of folks in the United States have two or more food related chronic illnesses. Um, so we did not solve the system. We created a system and now the work here upon all of us is to figure out how to create a new system that really starts to make sense. So this is a photo from 1916. This is um, <clears throat> one of the train stations in New York City when there were lots of rail strikes that were happening. And people were worried about food security, again, more than a century ago because they were already dependent upon things coming into the cities from the rural areas. And so as a result of that, there was a person who was in charge of basically what's the equivalent of the Port Authority um, of New York City now. His name is Walter Hedden. He's the person who we think is the first person who used this word food shed. And at that point, he was thinking about watersheds, which had come into play you know, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. People were starting to realize what comes in, you've got to be very careful and protective of. And so he was using food shed in this sense where he said the barriers which deflect raindrops into one river basin rather than into another are natural land elevations, while the barriers which guide and control movements of foodstuffs are more often economic than physical. So, you know, we've been thinking about food sheds, which is a little bit of a wonky word for a while. You know, there were those who drew maps and thought of them in terms of different crops that could be grown in different parts of the world. Um, this is a map from the 1800s. They didn't use the word food shed, but same kind of concept that was place-based or crop-based. This is one, you know, for, from the U.S. anyway, Thanksgiving food sheds. You could think about the turkeys there in brown, the cranberries, you, the sweet potatoes, and the green beans. And so, you know, maybe we have food sheds that are based on, on those particular crops. But there are other ways to think about it as well. Whoops. And so, you know, it, it's sort of funny. You write a book, and, and I say over and over again, you should really do the book tour first and then write the book because you'd get more stuff right. And, um, you know, in this case, as I was going through and looking at all the evolution of the, the word food shed and how it was used, it was, um, it was really fascinating. It was pretty academic. And finally, I, you know, during the book tour, I started to realize what makes sense to me is none of the academic jargon that's out there, even though that's kind of where I've, I've come from. It really is the periphery of our ability to influence positive change. It is for each of you what you need it to be. It's as far as you can reach. It's as much as you can do. It's as much as you can do in aggregation together. That for me is really a food shed. Forget the rest of it. <laughs> Just you know, do that and that's enough in terms of the definition. So this is taking you home a little bit. And what I'm going to do is sort of um, go in concentric circles out. This is the Vermont Farmers Food Center, uh, which I'm on the board now, which is in Rutland, Vermont. If you know Rutland, you know it's one of the most blue collar parts of, of Vermont. It's the place where it should not have been the first place in the state to have a year round farmers market that ran 52 weeks out of the year. The first place in the state to do that. 
and to not only do that, the first two years to do it in an unheated space. So my friend Greg Cox and others are the ones who got together to do that. Greg is just, he's a farmer who he says, I'm here to feed my community. You know, he's paid his, his employees out of cigar boxes at different points in time and paid them first and he didn't have a dime left and he was living in the TP, um, you know, in the process. He's an amazing person. So after two years of that, Greg said, yeah, this is okay, but um, you, know, you only need to be a pioneer so long. So he pulled together with some help of other folks, $10,000, bought an old lumber warehouse and the, the yard that was associated with it for $10,000, got the bank to agree to do that. Property value was just under 300,000 in a brown field in the toughest part of the city of from um, in the city of Rutland, without a doubt, just socioeconomically, not an easy place to do this right beside the railroad tracks. But Greg said the railroad tracks matter because the railroad tracks and there's a train, there's a rail car sitting out in front of the Vermont Farmers Food Center now, because he said, this is, we were the hub of Vermont. We were the ones who were getting food to those um, urban areas. And this is where it all started. And I want people to see that rail car. I want them to think about it. And I want them to figure out how we do that again. So he's actively been trying to find ways to get train cars back into New York City. But in the process, what we've done is um, it's just been incredible what's happened. It's not been easy. It's just, it's been the, the artisans, the, the crafts folks, uh, craftspersons um, have been the ones who've done this. They put the sweat equity in here. And so one of the things to be thinking about, even as you're thinking about your food hub, the first thing was to house the farmer's market once a week on Saturdays to get people to come together. And that in and of itself starts to spawn ideas. It starts to spawn networks. It creates the need for a commercial kitchen. It creates the need for education. It starts to create music, arts, crafts. So suddenly you've got a, Ver a winter farmer's market in Vermont that the very first year did about half a million, the second year outdoors. Um, it wasn't outdoors, it was in an unheated theater, 750,000. Um, by 2015, it had gone up to 2 million. Right now, it's more than that. I don't have the exact figures for where we are right now. But I, I wanna say it's also, it's not easy when you do this stuff because what happened this past year, so we've been fortunate enough now and it didn't hurt that we got the COVID funds that came through. We've been fortunate enough now that we've got you know, about 1.6, $1.7 million that are coming in to help us do more of this work that's coming in. In the process, even though the tests were done before when the property was purchased, there were more environmental tests because it was a brownfield. They found what are known as TCEs, uh, which have an interesting, the science is really hard to figure it out. So now we're having to do TS, TCE abatement from underneath the slab, ventilation systems. There are all sorts of things th that have happened. The farmer's market had to find another place for them last season, unfortunately this season as well. So it's been a blow, but that's what I mean. We have to find ways to sustain ourselves. Um, and fortunately we have an incredible board with all the right talent and diversity and an amazing staff and just the community has come forward. So we're figuring our way out of it, but this gives you a little bit of sense of, of what it's like. And with the kitchen and the greenhouse here that you can see, which the Rotary Club gave 120,000, I believe, to put up this greenhouse used for education. Um, you know, kids come in, do all sorts of really neat things to the point where we just reach capacity with the greenhouse. There was not enough greenhouse time and space to do all of the demands. So now the question is, can we go out into the schools to do a lot of this? So one of the things that's been really fantastic is the pharmacy project, Food is Medicine. So working with the healthcare community. So there are about 250 of those subscriptions that are generally paid for by donations and by grants worth about $250. Those provide 12 pounds. So what about um, five, five kilograms roughly of fresh produce 15 weeks out of the year and also once per month in the other months. 
Um, though, so the purchasers are made from farmers. They're made from very often beginning farmers who need the help. We're having that conversation at dinner with David. You know, young farmers trying to get this, this start. So trying to find a way to actually help lift them at the same time that we're lifting the community. Healthcare providers are making the recommendations of who should participate. It's been a fantastic program and has been replicated um, around the state. Another one is everyone eats. Again, COVID monies came in, and I just have to give the state of Vermont a lot of credit for using a lot of the federal funds to go to everyone eats. The idea is that at least 10% of the food that is going to be given to, for free to anyone who wants it, prepared meals twice to two, three times a week, those meals are that 10% of that food has to be local at least, um, it's very often more. Um, it's prepared in restaurants, general stores, places that have the commercial kitchens and had the need actually for the staffing. Um, it's worked out just incredibly well. It's also, it's what saved our tails with this TCE issue and um, because we've been able to generate enough money to keep our staff paid in other ways you know, to really hold us through. So we are a nonprofit. We had an anchor tenant also as well. Um, unfortunately, lost that anchor tenant because of this. Um, the whole anchor tenant discussion is something that's very interesting in food hubs. And um, so everyone eats. Unfortunately, we probably just got just a couple more months before that federal funding that has come through the state is going to disappear. Um, also, a podcast, which has been interviews with farmers in particular around the region. And it's just been fantastic in capturing that cultural history. And those photos very often of the farmers are also put up around the farmer's hall, uh, which is the place where we have the farmer's market. So one of the things is that we were all talking about, you know, what might be helpful for you all to think about, and there are no silver bullets, you know, anything I say here that you can't and should not be held against me, please, <laughs> you know, but trying to give you some, some wisdom of things that have worked really well. So part of what was happening um, about 15, 16 years ago. You know, we, we started, so many of us, myself included, we had these ideas bubbling up from our communities of the things we needed to do. We all needed a commercial kitchen. We all needed a food hub. We all needed to do incubation for um, beginning farmers. And it was interesting, we were all going to the same funders and they said, whoa, stop, put on the brakes, tap, tap. And um, we've got to get coordinated here. So basically is what I called it, you know, we were creating all these little food fiefdoms. And, um, and it just really wasn't working. And so the philanthropist said to their credit, we need to tap on the brakes. We need to make this coordinated. We need to make it strategic, do it at a state level. They provided the funds for us to have the first gathering, which turned out to be over 350 people from around the state, including the governor and secretary of agriculture. Everybody that we could pull in did it in Rutlands again, which I was very proud of. And so that began really the, um, what the state legislatures then gave, I think it was $140,000 to start this initiative, um, which is called Vermont Farm to Plate. So basically it was a, you know, if there are grad students out here, this all started in so many ways because of one grad student, Dave Timmons, who was doing the research and he was looking at farmers markets and local food purchasing around the country in the United States. And he said, Vermont's the highest. It's not only the highest, it's way beyond everybody else, but it's 5%. <laughs> you know, and um, so is that good? I don't know, but, you know, and we thought, well, what do we need to do in order to get that up to 10%? So basically um, what happened over time, I was very skeptical at the beginning, but Ellen Kaler stepped in, who was head of Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund. She said, listen, there's really cool stuff happening in the Midwest with an organization called REAMP. They're fighting coal-fired power plants. And um, basically what they're doing is they're doing the social network analysis to look at where all the impacts are happening, drawing together those organizations and those entities and initiatives and getting them together to start thinking strategically about how they might work together more effectively. And they're doing it by what's called a social network. And I was like, well, social network, okay. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Um, and it needs to be decentralized. It needs, I, I, people like me, I was saying it probably needs to be in the agency of ag or maybe in ag extension. Um, and, and Ellen was just adamant. She said, no, it, it needs to be decentralized. 
So, you know, what has happened has been pretty incredible. We wrote the first um, strategic plan for a state in the United States, a strategic food systems plan. Uh, we're now into the second iteration of that 10 year of the, so we're into the second 10 years now. We were at 5%. The figures are coming out in, I think, just a couple of weeks, but we're somewhere between 13 and 15% now. We took all the low hanging fruit. We got the apples, we got the milk, we got the cold dairy cows, sort of, um, you know, and now it's getting harder, more complex. But at this point, we actually have traction. This was the, um, the gathering just last week. So we have an annual gathering. It's every single year. Um, it's just a, it was so heartwarming to do it in person again and actually be together. And so usually 200 to 300 people gather together for one, one and a half, sometimes two days to try to figure this stuff out and do it strategically. So, you know, this network and the way it's been created is something to look at because again, skeptic here, you know, I, we've seen it work, it's moving ahead and um, it's actually going another step further as, you, as you'll see here. So, you know, of course, you, you sort of, you want to create a little bit of jealousy and competition out there. <laughs> and um, so all of a sudden, you know, the other New England states are like, how in the hell did Vermont do this? And um, so they decide, well, maybe we need to pull together and start having discussions. And again, Ellen has just, I keep wanting to run for governor or president. I don't care what she is, just she, she's amazing in all that she does. And so she and others have helped really spearhead this. So now uh, we have this New England Feeding New England is the name of the project, 30 by 30. They were talking about lower numbers. Some of us said, you know, let's not go too far because there were numbers of maybe 60%. Maybe that's more than we can really do, but let's get aggressive for the next 10 years or so. Let's see what we can do. So it's coordinated sort of at two different levels. It's a lot of the NGO players. It's the network systems that are there and established at the grassroots level. And it's the state actors, the state agencies and others um, who are involved. So trying really to coordinate this because we have to do it as a region. You know, and there are things that are just not there in Vermont, and there are things that aren't there in Maine, and we're all going and trying to also feed some of the same urban centers, and we have this incredible demographic, whereas if we get coordinated and we build more of the efficiencies, there's, there's more possibilities there. So that's what's happening. I think you know, the research, the planning, and the implementation, um, you know, with Ellen and others involved, things are going to happen. Will we hit 30%? I don't know. I hope so. It's not overly ambitious, but it's certainly ambitious enough. So I want to jump, and um, you all have done such a great job, I think, in your vision with breaking out food sovereignty, food justice, and right to food. And um, I just, I hit this the other day, I had to put it in there, the food sovereignty and the Italian version and getting the pineapple off the pizza. Um, so, you know, you, you do what you need to do to get there, you know, to be able to claim it your own. And um, that's what I'd like to dig into just a little bit deeper here as we go. So this, um, I was fortunate enough, I mean, you know, we all sort of have our touchstones um, and, and kind of how we got where we are. And I was lucky enough in 1983 to be a student in the um, South Tyrol region of the Alps, place I fell in love with and just um, kept going back and ended up going back and farming and living there for about four years. And um, one of my favorite places to go because I was growing grapes and apples and, you know, in the orchards and and that's what I did with my grandfather, and I'm all for that. But, man, animals are really interesting. <laughs> they move a lot, and they do interesting things. And my wife calls me that cows were out this afternoon. But anyway, the, um, you know, the, this, this place was the place that I, I went to very often just because I wanted to get away from the apples. I wanted to get away from the tr tr trees. I wanted to see more diversified agriculture. So this is that little village that I'll tell you more about. It's called Maltz, a tiny little village. It's, um, uh, it, it, that is in terms of people, just over a thousand inhabitants there, but then it's um, 92 square miles um, that it actually <clears throat> covers. And the interesting thing, and this speaks a lot to climate change, it's, it's at the very end of the Val Venosta, as you see it there. So the elevation works its way up here. So when I was first there in 1983, 
there was there were maybe some apples and courtyards in places in the village of Maltz, but there were not orchards. It, you, you couldn't grow them there. And now climate change, you can grow apples there and it's perfect because it's dry, it's got the right temperatures and the people down below who've been growing apples have made a bloody fortune and have been able to work their way up. In a lot of cases, some people there call it land grabbing, starting to take some of the land and malts. And um, oh, so this gives you a little bit of a perspective. Um, so malts actually has, the, it's a series of village uh, villages with them um, Malts being in the middle there, just spectacular in terms of you know, scenery. You can just get a sense there of the, the diversity and the beauty and why people would care about it and what they've got. And so this is it a little closer. And so I was back in 2014 leading a study tour with um, some graduate students and my friend Brigitte there said, you know, in Maltz, they're actually having a referendum right now while you're here and you should go up. And I said, well, what's the referendum? She said to ban all synthetic pesticides. And I was like, are you serious? Because nowhere in the world that I knew had ever done that. And then I came back and did the research, couldn't find anywhere in the world that had done that. So I took the graduate students up and started this journey of um, about two years trying to document what had happened there. So this is malts back in the 1970s. You can see the grain fields that are here where apples um, have begun to move in. In some cases, you get a sense of the diversity just looking at that photograph. This is right in the center of town. So you've got um, rye, and then you've got the, the potato field there right beside the old Car Carolingian church from 800. It's a place steeped in history. It's a, you know, but the South Tyrol region is famous for apples. You know, one in seven apples in <clears throat> Europe, if you buy an apple, probably came from the South Tyrol. And so this was back from, this is from the 1920s, just down below where I was farming. I could have hit those guys with a stone if the timing was right. And my arm was stronger. They were already spraying pesticides at that point, you know, almost 100 years ago. That was part of the, the culture there. This is what the village that, um, that I first started, this is most of the village now. This is what it looks like. Productivity, yeah, figured a lot of stuff out, um, but then you start to take control of the landscape. And then you put the hail nets on, which prevent birds, prevent hail, prevent sun scald, but, and you also save yourself. It basically, it's the cost of um, three years of insurance. Um, I, I'm sorry, it's the, um, it's the cost of one years of insurance to put up the hail, the, the hail nets and put them over. So it starts to change the landscape quite a bit. The people in Maltz not only didn't want the pesticides, they didn't want all the infrastructure that came with this. And so basically a farmer there on a hectare, so 2.5 acres, it can earn anywhere between 20,000 and 40,000 euros net, um, which is just extraordinary. So there is a lot of cash there. In one case, I talked to one banker. He said it was one farmer who came in and put a million dollars in cash from one apple crop. Um, and they're small growers, you know, they're family scale. So it's not always scale, you know, it's kind of what, what happens with it. And so this is also the place where the Iceman was found, which you may remember. And the Iceman was found right up in the mountains, right above Maltz. And so here you've got 5,300 years of food traditions. You know, the, the part of what I loved researching for the book was just his GI tract and what they did and going in, they found the, the smoke wild sheep, they found the smoke wild boar, uh, and not the boar, the um, goat. They found five different grains that have st were still grown in the region until the 1900s. Um, I mean, just extraordinary, all this history. So when we think about food sovereignty, we think about indigenous knowledge and traditions and ways of knowing. These folks are steeped in it. And right below, so he was, he was found just on the north side of the Val Venosta there. Right below, this is from my friend's farm. This is what you see, the spraying of pesticides in the spring. Um, I've got a great video of it that we, we can't show, but just where they're going through spraying the pesticides several times a week. This family happens to be an organic herb farm, which is actually one of the most interesting herb farms I've ever seen. Their names are the, um, the Gluters. They had to cover, this is not a joke, they had to cover their entire organic farm with high tunnels because of the pesticides. Not only that, when it rains, 
they actually have to send the rainwater off site because of it's, uh, and that is all of um, the rainwater that's coming off the high tunnels. They have to send it off site because it's so contaminated with pesticides. So this was the bellwether. They were right at the part of the valley where the apples were starting to come in and they're the, they were the canary in the cold mine. And um, what I'm showing you here now, are these are images that a friend of mine, Douglas Gayton of the Lexicon took. And Douglas uh, does a, just, he's a multimedia artist and um, you know, a great friend and someone I work with and for now quite a bit. And, um, and so Douglas does these information artworks. You may have seen some of them in various places. So we went in and we did 24 of these artworks where he does the writing on them to something he started when he was living in Italy. And basically we made up all the, um, all the German names since Germans are so good at squashing together words. We said, well, we can do that too. And um, appropriation, I granted, but it was fun. And um, so we made up these words to just so, show some of the absurdity of what these people were dealing with. So uh, this is someone who's become a good friend who is a dairy farmer. You can see the apples on either side of him. His hay crop was tainted in 2014, and that's what set off the alarm bells because his hay crop was tainted. He had to get rid of it. First crop, second crop, tainted. Third crop tainted. Not only could he not feed it to the animals, he had to get it off site. And he's like, what do I do? It's polluted. Where do, who do I give the hay to at this point? You know, what, what am I supposed to do? And there's a three meter buffer. So, you know, about 10 feet, three meter buffer between that was required at that point in time. So this is where things set off. And I'm just going to give you the cast of characters so you can kind of see everybody makes a difference in these movements. And this is a community that became a, really, they, they did create a movement unintending, unintendedly, they created a movement throughout Europe. So now there's a pesticide towns, pesticide free towns network throughout Europe. Um, I went with them to Brussels, to the EU to present on their story. And we took the information artworks and, and displayed those. But you can see here um, what happened. This is Uli, as he's known, Ulrich, uh, who was the mayor. In a lot of ways, just went through hell. He had to have that inner fortitude to get through all of this um, and served as mayor in trying to advance this, move this forward, get this to the point where it could be a public referendum. And 79, 74% of the people voted for the what they called a pesticide-free future. And 69%, um, so it was 74% participation, 69% in favor. It's just extraordinary. It has been through the courts. It's going through the courts. It's headed probably to Brussels still. Um, again, this now, this started in 2014, and they're still having to work their way through this. But people came on board, the seed savers, Edith and Robert, you know, who just have been, they were saving the old grains, um, you know, and, and they were there and committed. And they said, well, what happens if the pesticides move in? And we have all of our um, display gardens here. And then here they are with compost. And Robert always says, I take care of everything underground. She takes every, care of everything over, above ground. And that keeps the marriage intact. And we're all good. <laughs> and, um, and uh, these, these folks have a really wonderful farm where they're doing a lot of education for tourists, um, as well as the, the school children in the area on the old ways. Um, the, you know, you've always got to have that gadfly. This is Conrad, who um, you know, has a guest house and just is a provocateur all the time and pushing the envelope. You know, even the, the bakers, um, you know, this guy, the, is um, just an amazing baker and the sourdough that's right there below him in the, um, the little bucket, um, it's older than he is, the, the mother. And you know, so he's like, Why, we, we have to have an organic future. And then Agidius, uh, who's just an incredible orchardist, they had the best organic orchard that I'd ever seen in that entire region, um, just blew me away. And Evelyn, who's a mother who's got a kid with extreme food allergies. So she's having to buy all organic before all of this happened. And now she's been trying to figure this out and she feeds into the story a little more. Um, and Peter, the vet working with Hans here, who's a um, organic dairy. Peter is the, the, is the town veterinarian. 
He knows everything that happens, you know, in the farmyard, in the barn, in the house, on people's finances. And, you know, he's just an adamant um, protector of the environment. And so he's been one of the folks you just don't want to screw with him. (laughs) He's he's, he's a big guy. And then, um, you know, someone, Alexander Agatley, um, who raised, I think it was $165,000 by pre-selling cheese for the next 10 years. So, you know, it was this innovative um, idea that he had where he said, you know, how am I going to do this? I want to have an organic dairy. I want to make some of the best cheese in all of Europe. And I've got to figure out how it is I'm going to finance it. So he did it. So there were actually even some um, hotels in Germany that went ahead and prepaid. Basically, he created his own currency. He went to the tax authority. Authorities. He said, is there anything illegal about creating your own currency? They said, not as long as you pay taxes. And he said, well, there we go. And um, so now you can buy Engelhorner and he has them printed out. And, um, you know, this has not been an easy scenario for him because of the pesticide contamination. And he won first prize in Europe for his cheese, um, which is saying something. And then when you're dealing in parts per million, parts per billion, who do you need on your side? You need a pharmacist who understands that. And Johannes has just been, you know, the perfect scientist to have there, um, you know, when the going has gotten tough in terms of really being able to explain the science of what's going on. Not bad either when you can get the town pediatrician, you know, who also understands what's happening and can explain things in medical terms. And so, um, you know, getting those two together was really critical. And so, as you can see here, um, they say um, a healthy homeland. Yes, um, it's basically our living room, our living area free from pesticides. And I'll tell you just a little more about that. So then they, they did get stalled. And then all of a sudden, this group of women got together. I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but it was mothers who got together. They chose a dialect word, which is Olivint, which means stop right there. Don't go any further. Don't make another move. So Holovint um, was this gathering of women that pulled together. They're the ones who started to do this campaign. They actually dressed up um, dummies, and they were in a barn up above the um, village market that is every Wednesday. They were up in a barn, I think it was on Tuesday night, <clears throat> stuffing these Tyvek pesticide suits full of hay. And then they brought them down before daylight, and they gave all the different pesticides that were being used you know, were there displayed on the Tyvek dummies that were displayed all over the farmer's market. Um, super savvy, wrote letters to the editor, got a number of people to write letters to the editor. One day there were, eight, I think, over 80 letters to the editor that appeared at one time. They got this um, together, which is a brochure, where they got everyone with a PhD, a medical degree, or an environmental doctorate um, to sign on to it. Everybody except for three in this region signed on to it to say how important it was. And um, then one night uh, before the... um, Before they had the referendum, all of a sudden there were, I think it was over 180 different signs and tapestries appeared overnight in the middle of the night that was led by these women who'd done all the stenciling of, you know, bed sheets and all these other things that appeared. They appeared all over the place, our landscape. um, Let's use it and use it and keep it free from pesticides for us and our guests. And again, guests were important because they're 26% of the economy. Agriculture is only about 6%, I believe. And then even got the, um, you know, uh, the abbot, you know, who started demanding that not only could they not use pesticides there, but they would plant um, all their grapes for the communion wine would be organic as well. And again, Pope Francis, the whole encyclical, this really helped in, in that process. So, whoops, there's the conversion issue. But um, they utilized the precautionary principle, which is just such a critical piece in being able to, to move this forward. And the, one of the most important lessons, I think, for all of us is that um, they were at one of the meetings of whole event of the women. And one of the women who's a beekeeper, she said, we have to stop saying, you know, that we're going to ban things. We have to stop saying no, not, never. We have to start putting everything in positive terms. So, yeah, with the sunflower, you know, yes, vote yes for a pesticide-free future really became their mantra as they were moving forward. 
And what this led to, and starting to expand out a little bit, is um, you know, I, I was lucky enough to get Vandana Shiva um, was gracious and said she would write the foreword for the book. And uh, she'd heard about Malt, she'd written a letter of support, and she invited um, Uli, the mayor, and myself to come over where she um, just did this amazing event in New Delhi that was uniting communities for an organic future. And so this is Uli here, and he said, of all the things I've done, he said, this is what has just given me the most hope and sustenance and, and the ability to move forward. And so she presented him, but, well, in this case, she was presenting these pieces, but this is the, um, the prime minister, or not prime minister, but the minister of um, scheme in India, who has also, I think he's been elected now eight times as the minister and has been the one who's been pushing for the 100% organic fu um, free future. They're not there, they're working on it, they're trying to figure it out, um, you know, but really doing great work. And Vandana's idea is to bring these communities, particularly from the mountain regions around the world, the small communities together, because united, there's this hope that maybe we can advance some of these things we care about. And so um, also, <clears throat> And Navdanya wrote this really beautiful piece on, you know, what it is we need to do in order to advance what not just calling organic, but really poison free, not just pesticide free, but poison free communities. So, um, you know, as a consequence, uh, it was able to have some time at Navdanya, which I think just it's the farm that again, things start small, they start organically. Um, Vandana told me the story as we were riding around. She said, you know, my mother, when I was trying to decide after Bhopal what to do, she said, well, you can have the cow barn, you know, the two cows have to go out, but you can start there. And that was her first office was the cow barn after she cleaned it out and then began to build this farm, which has become an educational farm. And I'll just show you a little bit there of, of what it looks like. Um, so Navdanya means nine seeds. This is her with some of the students that uh, she's got a seminar with. She brings in experts from all over the world um, in order to give lectures you know, for folks there. You just get a sense of the beauty of the landscape. It sleeps 60 or 70 people there. Um, highly recommend visiting or interning, whatever it is you might be able to do there. Um, this is the seed room, which I'll show you here. This is the seed drying that happens there. And you'll see why this is so astonishing. This, these are the seeds drying with the leader of the um, seed saving project here. And just start to get a sense of how important this is in doing the work that they're doing. Look at the number of varieties of patty of rice, 2010 to um, this point, 2017. 450 varieties, beginning with that many, getting up to 716, I think they got to 800 you know, just a couple of years ago, going through, and these are things, these are seeds they're saving on the farm. And they're not just doing it in the little vials, they're doing it so that if they have to, if there's a flooded area, a natural disaster, a human-made disaster, they can get truckloads of those seeds there to those farmers. Seeds that are drought resilient, that are resilient to, um, you know, high levels of moisture, you know, whatever it might be, salty soils in some cases. And of course, it starts with vermicomposting in so many ways. And you may know the story of Sir Albert Howard, um, who was sent to India, and he was supposed to actually take the, the British education to them, ended up, he's the one who ended up learning the most and writing an agricultural testament, um, you know, which really spun out of that. And secret to any grad students or people with extra time, his two wives were sisters um, and the, the first one died, the other one came in and I'm convinced they did a lot of the work and somebody needs to do that research and write that story. Um, so go there. And of course, cow manure in this case being a very important part of it. These are the milk cows for the farm, the vermicomposting, the teaching some of the interns there who come from all over the world, uh, how to use the compost how to also create aesthetics while also dealing with water retention to capture as much water as possible. Um, working on millet as one of the traditional sources of sustenance that they want to make sure they maintain. Um, <clears throat> and so various examples. And so usually it's about a three by three meter plot for doing the saving. Fiber plants, again, the interpretation, some of the um, uh, traditional plants that were used to repel pests of different kinds. 
and her staff goes out, they're just incredible, go out into the field, particularly into the Himalayas. This is one of the places where they took us to visit and just a couple of extraordinary villages. We were walking up and you could see this on Monsanto go back as we were going in, um, which is kind of funny. And you, know, you see the traditional houses and people doing their own seed saving on top of their roofs there. And um, just really pretty extraordinary to see all of the seeds being saved. And then this was the gathering again of the women. The women are really the caretakers of the seed in this region. And this is the gathering and that's Negi G who is doing the education, talking about biodiversity and the kinds of seeds that can be planted and sharing the knowledge. He grew up there, so he's not an outsider who's coming in. And just you know, stunning, stunning people, stunning culture. And I'll tell you a little more about what it is they're doing, but just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview there. But just spectacular and of course, incredibly gracious to all of us who came with the food and the cattle being a critical part, hay drying in the trees. And then they took us to another village where they wanted us to prepare a lunch from scratch so that we could see the entire process. And the reason I put this in here this is the most intact food system I've ever seen in my life. You know, and, and I don't know if I'll ever see it again. This was where everything that we had came from there. They walked us through the process. They also taught us how to make the plates out of leaves so that there was no food waste you know, or, or paper waste as well. And um, you know, sesame, both the black and the, the regular sesame seeds and just incredibly, incredibly um, gracious in the whole process. My foot with flies, there's a reason for that. <laughs> and then also going in and rebuilding schools in the region because the schools, the, the children really are the future of this whole movement. And this was after the floods that they had in this region um, a couple of years earlier. And just an incredible gift to the kids who wouldn't have had you know, these places to meet otherwise. So I'm gonna I'm zeroing in here, Bob. We're close. Um, and so this is going back to um, to New Delhi to a market that's dedicated to organic goods. If you ever get to Delhi and have the chance, you should definitely go visit it. Um, really, just extraordinary to to see what they have. And of course, these signs are all over the place. You know, the the Coke and Pepsi free zone. And um, Vandana had a hand in that. I can assure you. <laughs> and this is the Vandana, uh, the, um, the Navdanya Cafe and restaurant, and where they also sell a lot of the goods there. So again, getting things from the rural areas to the urban markets. And what I think is so important too, is while I was there, they were really focused on women entrepreneurs. And I, I bring this out um, and I, I mean it truly, and I say it a lot, and that's not to make it trite. I, I really do think that women are the, not only the future, they're the past also of, of really sustainable food systems. I mean, women have, you've, you've gotten it, you know, it's nature, it's nurture, nutrition, you know, and I think sort of the, the sort of male paradigm that we put forward has really taken us down the tubes. And so, you know, the more I see this, the more it, it gives me hope when there are things like this. So I wanna wrap up here and, and talking, this is dumb, jumping to Bhutan. And, um, you know, Bhutan has a really interesting scenario right now. And I've got friends who are there who are doing some work, um, trying to figure things out because right now, 90% of Bhutan's food is imported from India. And in a lot of cases, it's not nutritious food. Um, and the rice that's coming in is not the most nutritious form of rice. So my friend Dutch and Dorji works for the World Wildlife Foundation and he was the secretary to the King of Bhutan for five years. And um, you know, Dutch and talks about just this need for Bhutan to find ways more to some sort of food self-sufficiency, um, to food sovereignty. And it is hard. And right now, Dechen is in charge of Asia for WWF. And so he's a very complex thinker and understands this scenario. And um, it's, it's a bit of a struggle. One of the great things that has happened, Bhutan for Life, there was a move several years back that Dechen and other um, folks that I know and work with are um, work to raise $43 million to conserve more than half of Bhutan's um, natural ecosystems in perpetuity. And so they did that, 
it's an extraordinary story and perpetuity always has a lifespan to it. Um, so they've still got to find ways to fund themselves. And so the government, the king, NGOs, people are trying to figure out what to do in Bhutan and how to regain this um, sovereignty of their food systems. So I want to put something out there, not because I'm advocating for it and I'm not advocating against it. I'm saying this is real. This is something that is happening. It's at play. And it's something that I think we need to be a little more aware of. So this actually comes from the World Economic Forum and sometimes a fan, sometimes not. Um, but this is an interesting study on economic viability for farmers in Europe. So basically what they did was a really interesting study across Europe, trying to figure out how do we actually make things more economically viable for farmers. So we can do the operational things that are there at the bottom, you know, the operational efficiencies. We can do value chain efficiencies. Is that enough? We don't necessarily think so. And so then you get into the co-benefits, this whole question of payment for ecosystem services, which I wanna dive into really quickly. Um, because this, it's happening, it's out there. There's this idea that with ecosystem services, if you have the stewards, if you have the farmers, the foresters, the fishers, why is it they're not also getting paid for their stewardship? Why is the marginal income so menial that people can't get by? It, we're actually, we're providing in many cases incentives for people to do the wrong thing, um, but we're not providing incentives enough for people to do the right thing. This is a controversial topic, um, and I'm just gonna admit that, but we also are thinking about how we might restructure our economies and our ways of thinking and so this whole notion of ecosystem services is if you provide a good, that is clean water, clean air, climate, healthy soil, are there alternative ways or additional ways that you can also be paid for that so that you can actually continue to do it? And the reason for me, in, in, in one sense, that this feels so critical to try to figure out in some fashion, just had two fantastic seventh generation farmers in my valley, young, you know, in their 30s and 40s both organic, <coughs> one dairy, one beef, both within the last six months had to sell their herds. They had to sell their herds to keep the farms because it was not economically viable to do this without running things into the ground. They're doing all the right things. They did all the basics. They did the value added with organic. That was not enough. And now they're trying to reconfigure and figure out what to do. So are there some other things that we can do, you know, to provide some, some benefits here? This is a study, we all take them kind of, um, you know, we, we question things that are out there. But this was a study done by Bob Costanza, Jillian, I don't know what you think of Bob as you're out there somewhere, but, you know, an ecological economist and, um, and some other folks in Bhutan looking at okay, if you did this payment for ecosystem services in Bhutan, what might it look like? So the estimated, that this is 2012 that they did the study, came out in 2013. They estimated the, estimated that the value of ecosystem services could be 15.5 billion per year. The GDP for Bhutan at the same point was 3.5 billion per year. Does it make sense to try to figure out something so that we can actually begin to augment the incomes? As you talk about you know, um, universal basic income, <clears throat> there are places in the world that are trying to figure out whether UBI is or should be related to ecosystem services. Um, so you know, these are things to be thinking about. The estimated per capita income at 15, 4,000 per year is what they were estimating, 5,000 from goods and, and services. This is for individuals and maybe 10,000 from ecosystem services. And Bhutan, bear in mind, you know, is carbon negative and the only country in the world that's carbon negative. So these are the things that I think we're trying to figure out. <clears throat> I was in Colombia, South America, recently with some folks who were working on blockchain and they're trying to figure out with blockchain basically, you know, which provides us this opportunity to store data in a very complex manner. It allows us to be able to store data. It can be as simple as tracking a tomato all the way from the seed that's purchased all the way to the end user and knowing every single thing that happened that's recorded in between. So that could be kind of cool for some of us. <coughs> um, it also gets much more complex and gets into other worlds. <coughs> Excuse me, but folks are trying to figure this out. 
And these are good folks who are trying to figure it out. Like for this farmer that um, my friend Douglas and I met, who's a cacao farmer, he's just not sure the organic market is gonna make it um, and, and do what he needs to do to have a viable farm. It doesn't seem like it. So he's looking for another method. And just to round it out, here we are last week at Vermont Farm to Plate at our annual gathering. And there's a presentation about looking at a $100 million fund that's based on ecosystem service payments to farmers um, that would, it's fairly complex in the model, but it's there, those conversations are there. And whether you like it or not, it's always better to know that it's going on. It's better to think about it. It doesn't have to be any one way. There are lots of ways that this could look in the end. Um, and we just have to see, is there a way to make sure that we get more money to the stewards of our food systems? So I'll leave it there. That's for my farm. Um, for all of us, things are a little foggy, but the sun's coming out. Good things are happening no matter what we do. And um, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Bob, I, were we going to do questions yes. now? Is it, not, do folks need a microphone or is it? There's a lonely mic. Okay. Oh, oh, yes, thanks. I just couldn't get to it fast enough, but thank you. Well, they're like two terrible things of your speaker. One is to be before the meal. The other is after people have eaten a big meal. And the third is like before they get to the bar and I've got two strikes against me. So yeah, yeah. see. Oh, yes, sir. Hardwick, Vermont. So yeah, Hardwick, Vermont, the town that food saved, um, you know, it, I think it is an incredible story. You know, there, there are folks who gather together from lots of different businesses in the agricultural sector and you know, really wanted to pull together a food system that would make sense. There've been bumps along the way, bumps and bruises. From my vantage point, and again, kind of limited, one of the best things that came out of that, and this may be for the Food Hub folks, is the um, Center for an Agricultural Economy, I mean, CAE, Center for an Agricultural Economy, which has been a food hub that has been led just extremely well, um, you know, led and they've weathered a, a lot of real challenges. They've done, they've incorporated the processing. They've tried to figure out when the processing makes sense. They've tried to figure out whether the processing can be done at a viable level for institutional purchasing. Institutional purchasing is something we, we all, I think, probably really want, especially when it comes to school systems and places like that. Economically, it's it's wicked challenging. They've run some of the best numbers and track those now. Um, so if you all haven't gotten those numbers from John Ramsey, who's the executive director, I think he would be willing to share those with you to help you understand that. One of the things that CAE is doing now is they've actually, they've started doing more distribution than they thought they would. So the last time I talked to John, almost this time last year, they were at 90% break even for their distribution. They were 10% funded by philanthropy to do the rest. They were starting to backhaul and create this more complex system so that as they were taking things out, they were picking things up and moving them around. They were trying to figure out what they needed to charge the farmers in terms of um, you know, fee and Black River Produce and others were charging around 30, 35% to farmers. CAE has tried to get it to within 10 to 15%. Um, so, so there are good things happening there and high mowing seeds is doing great. Um, you know, also the, um, the peach greens, the vegetable operations doing really well. Other things have fallen off to the side. Um, the Jasper Hill creamery, just amazing. Um, yeah, so, so there's still really good things happening. Again, I love the stories when they're in the unlikely places and you drive through Hardwick, you would not think that this might happen. You same with the Vermont Farmers Food Center. Um, but those are the places where there's hope and there's drive to get stuff done, which is really awesome. Hi. Hi. Uh, 
hope you can hear me. I'll just keep my mask. I think on. so. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you for your presentation. And I'm just thinking about you made several very interesting comments. Um, one of them was the role of women in regenerative agriculture and seed saving, those kind of things. Um, and I think that's important, but not to uh, enable men to abdicate their responsibility as well. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, <just> Thank <laughs> you. Ding. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it's important what you were talking about, um, Vandana Shiva raises, um, you know, how do we get back to that very localized, contextualized food system? And I think you mentioned that you that was the first time that you've seen a very effective food system on the ground in India. So you've talked to us about what you're doing in Vermont. And then I'm also thinking about that very localized food system. And we all understand that the global food system is broken. Yep. Like we can't be trying to patch it because it's not about that. It's actually about rebuilding yep. and collective um, rebuilding of that to imagine what is uh, a vision that is inclusive uh, and, and what that looks like when it comes to a globalized food system and whether maybe we do we need a global food system that's the mm -hmm. question mm -hmm. um, but then also you know in in Vermont what you're doing uh, are you engaging with these kind of questions and where do and do are there voices that are on the margins of society inputting into that conversation in very intentional ways? Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, all great points and great questions and I think she needs to be the next speaker, Bob. <laughs> no, yeah, I think, you know, those are great questions. I, at, at this point in my own thinking, you know, it, it just seems that we have to do what we care about that's local without being parochial you know, that's sometimes the challenge. We can get insular, we can get parochial. You know, local is not always a good thing. I mean, I grew up in a town in North Carolina where the Ku Klux Klan had welcome signs on three sides of town when you came in. Um, so I think we need to be careful when we talk about local control and, and what that might be. It needs to be local, as you're saying, in the, the best sense of the word. And how do we, how do we knit together, you know, local until it becomes regional? And then, you know, we, we still probably, you know, we, we need national food systems in some form or fashion. We appreciate global food systems. So it sort of goes back in a lot of ways, I think, to what my friend Dutchin, you know, calls sincerity of intent. You know, it's that integrity. It's, it's how do we trust the other players and, and know that there's integrity and that there's inclusiveness. And I have to say, I mean, Vermont has tried, so it's never good enough and it's never hard enough, but I think, you know, Vermont has been, try, been trying really, really hard to make sure things are more inclusive than they have been. And when you've got a state that's already predominantly white and that's their tradition, it, it can be a challenge. Um, you know, it's a challenge for everybody to, to try and figure that out. But what I really like about Farm to Plate is there's just been such a concerted effort to make sure that that's the case as much as possible. And again, it's never enough and it's never perfect, but it's, it's there, it's in writing, it's very clear. It was a more diverse gathering last week than most gatherings I go to in Vermont. It was also, and this is the heartening piece as well, it was just the number of young people who stepped into the game. Thank goodness. You know, that was the case in Columbia, the, you know, and, and the meeting there. It was young people who were stepping into the game because these, we need people who are eventually going to have 20 or 30 or 40 years of experience and kind of tracking this. I mean, now I'm one of the, the old guys, you know, um, you know, but we, we need those new players and we need more diversity. Yeah, I, I just, I hesitate particularly in the United States to give people too much of an excuse to get parochial and not to be reminded of the other parts of the, the global food system. Um, but you're right. Yeah, correcting it is just brutal. I think Vandana's approach is about as good as we're going to get. Let's let's all work together at the community and the international level, and and we learn a lot. And we need to be reminded of the socioeconomics of the rest of the world, as as well, that aren't our realities. 
Thank you all very much. What kept going through my head is we're all in this together. And I think as we look around this room this evening, we see many of the players who've been doing this, who've been following Farm to Play, who've been seeing what's been going on with Ventana, who, who know that we are each individually making a difference, <clears throat> but we have to do it together. And we have to do it with the right heart and the right mind, and we have to do it for successive generations. We need good food ourselves for all of us, but thank you, Philip, for bringing to us that overview that we all need to be reminded of from time to time. And I'm so glad that we're all here tonight to hear that and, and uh, to uh, um, have more conversations with you over the next couple of days. So thank you. And I'd like to ask Amy Melmock to, to come. I think she has a different title, so I'm going to read that. <laughs> um, um, acting director, industry, acting executive director of industry and marketing, Nova Scotia Department of Agriculture, to give us an update on market development initiatives. And this ties in with what we are just hearing because if we don't sell ourselves and, and our fellow citizens on good food, on putting the fourth leg on that table, as one farmer said to me one time, then we're, 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 we're working with one hand behind our back. So thank you, Amy. Well, hello everyone, and uh, I have to say it's a little daunting to follow such an amazing uh, keynote speaker. I was really inspired by what you had to say, Philip, and it, it certainly uh, made me re reflect, and I, I think I've learned mo more in the last two hours uh, than I have in uh, several weeks, and I think it's appropriate that we're here in the, the hurricane room tonight, having been blown off course by Fiona so significantly in this region for our farmers and that's that's been a big focus of ours in the Department of Agriculture, I have to say. There's a lot of tired looking people in our department these days because we're, we're trying very hard to react to some of those realities on the ground for a lot of uh, very hard hit farmers in the region and particularly in this region. So it's been an interesting and challenging time to be the, what, what did you say, Linda? The, uh, the executive director, the acting executive director of industry and uh, business development. And that's a, that's a lofty title that takes into account uh, the fact that I, I have the privilege of working with some really great people. And I wanna actually point out some of them in the room tonight um, and say that the areas that I work with are in marketing, and I also have uh, staff who work every day with people on the ground and uh, through the sector development division. And we also have under my tent right now programs. So one of the things that we're really looking at in the program division right now is how can we really go deep and dig deep on how we can support local food? And those conversations right now are part of my everyday. So I really um, uh, look forward to hearing uh, so much that comes out of this event because I think it, we really do need to inform our programs going forward in terms of what is important to the local food agenda. And that's part of our, our new government's mandate. 
it's and it's a big part of what drives us in in what we want to do in the in the department of agriculture so i said i wanted to acknowledge some of the people in the room nicole burkhardt who is here who's part of our sector development team and our business development officer down in cornwallis came all the way up here she has been a, a tremendous champion of organic food and, and throughout COVID, she actually spent a lot of her time working with smaller producers and helping them with their direct sales needs. We have Rebecca Sukesum, <laughs> Becky as she's better known, uh, of a farmer herself, and also a tremendous champion for diversity, uh, for uh, Ag in the Classroom and, and so many important initiatives within regional services. And we have Krista Tobin, who's a new member of, of the marketing team. And uh, Krista actually um, joined us to, specifically to work on that institutional procurement file, getting local food into our schools and our hospitals and our nursing homes. So over the next couple of months, I guarantee you that you'll be hearing a lot about the different pilots that Kirsten and her team, our working groups are trying to bring together to get local food better represented in our institutions. We keep trying to come up with a better word for institutions, to be honest, it sounds horrible, but those public domains where our food resides. So very important. I'm gonna to touch briefly, very briefly on what we do in the market uh, de development, because that's what was built on the, the thing tonight. But I wanna circle back to some of the things that Philip said as I, as I uh, take up rapidly my 10 minutes here. And within the market development division, I think there's two important things as Linda has uh, alluded to. The, the emphasis on trying to promote local food. Now we're all waiting to see, as are we in the department, <laughs> what the implications are around Nova Scotia local. But we're not resting on our hands and waiting for those initiatives to roll out. We have staff on the ground, Patrick Kelly, who uh, is, is down in the Kentville area, Morgan McKinnon, and others who are really, um, uh, I'm going to borrow your phrase, digging in and trying to, uh, trying to get local food promoted through the festivals and events and activities that are taking place throughout this province. So they were there for events like the Devour Festival. They were there to provide marketing support for the recent uh, Nourish campaign, actually, where they were trying to uh, sell the Nourish boxes as a, as a promotion for local food and to, for school, school programs as well. So they've been very much a part of trying to do that as we wait um, sometimes patiently, sometimes not so patiently, to see what the implications of Nova Scotia loyal are. But we know that our goal, regardless, will be to promote in every way that we can the importance of local food from a awareness piece in terms of its health benefits, in terms of its benefits to our rural communities, and also in terms of its benefit to um, just holding together the fabric of, of who our local producers are here in this province. We know that from a marketing division point of view, as I, as I mentioned, that institutional procurement piece is very important. And um, as I say, that, that whole aspect of what we're going to be doing is going to be continuing to grow and continuing to evolve over the next year so that you'll see consistently projects rolling out. And if you haven't had the chance to speak to Krista, please do, please reach out to her this week because, or, or over the next couple of days, because she really does want to work with producers large and small to see who we can get involved in the various pilots. And I know she's, She's had discussions with the food hubs, with, <laughs> I see uh, our, our representative back there, Heather, from the food hubs. So there's, there's lots of good synergy going on. And I, Linda, I know Linda wants to be part of those conversations as well. So I do want to end on that reflection that was brought forward that we do need to work together. 
And one of the the things that um, that I really uh, heard you say, Philip, was the notion that we need to have a coordinated approach to how we ask for people to come together. I spent a good portion of my career not only working in uh, economic development and in, in food, but also in the cultural community. And the cultural community has a lot in common with the agricultural community. It tends to be driven by really passionate people who are not particularly well paid and who are committed to what they do in a, in a spiritual uh, way. They work in, in isolation often. And one of the things that, that I have to give the cultural community credit for is when they have an initiative that they want to work on, they will ask for people to come around the table and so when I was uh, the, the, um, the general manager at Neptune Theatre, and we were looking for funds to, to develop infrastructure, there are new programs. It wasn't uncommon for economic development and ACOA and all of the people and Canadian heritage and all of the people who influenced our world to be sitting around the table together and talking about how we could best support an initiative. And I think that has to happen more in agriculture. And we certainly promote that idea that we need to work collaboratively with other departments and with other levels of government. You have a tremendous number of advocates too in the municipal world. Um, you know, at, at our food conference recently, I heard about an initiative that's going on in Berwick uh, where what they're trying to do in that community is gather the through the Valley Enterprise Network there, a, a resource to try and bring together new research and new developments for that community using the energy that's coming out of their municipal governments through the training that they've taken through um, programs like MIT. That's an incredible resource. And we don't draw on that collective resource often enough, bringing people all together around the table. So um, I'm a fan of that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I challenge you to challenge us to bring those, bring all of those players around the table when we're looking um, for solutions. Um, one of the reflections I had tonight as I was, I was hearing too, um, I come from the prairies, actually. And when I was growing up, I ate a lot of local food. I ate the fish that my father caught in the Northern Lakes up in the Wabasca area. I ate the ducks. I ate the, that, you know, he and his, his friends uh, hunted for and, uh, and, and the geese. I ate the, the, the produce that came not from the farmer's market because that was long before farmer's markets. It came from going down to the poorest part of Edmonton where the farmers were gathered and selling in bulk things like turnips and, and, and potatoes and celery. My father prepared that food because it came out of the depression and because local food was a way of surviving the, the terrible, terrible social conditions that were in play at that time. And it was part of the fabric of his being and my grandmother, my Ukrainian grandmother's being. My Ukrainian grandmother um, grew food on a two acre garden. She had such bad rheumatism that she could hardly get around that garden but she grew it that food because it was a way for her and her family to survive. And now through the, the auspices of a centralized food system, food has become cheap and affordable, but less and less does it actually uh, benefit the producer. And that is the challenge. 
it's a challenge that we're well aware of within the Department of Agriculture. And so it's interesting to see that paradox, I think, within that, our food system, where we have a, a centralized food system and siloed areas of support. And those are the things that we have to fix. So I just want to close with the idea that, you know, sometimes it won't always seem like we're pulling in the same direction. But um, a while back ago, I went back to the West Coast to live there for a few years. And I came back by choice to, um, to be uh, a Nova Scotian by choice because I had fallen in love in the 20 years that I was here with the kinds of people that were in this community. But before I left, I went to the Nova, to, I went to the art gallery in Victoria, and there was a sign up from the 16th century from a Japanese artist, and he said, and it said, what is your intention? And I think that's what we have to remember, that although it, it might not seem that we're always pulling in the same direction, we have to honor our intention. And our intention, um, in the words of Robert McDonough, who is I'm sure someone you're familiar with, um, uh, a great advocate of, of, uh, of circles of, um, you know, of uh, doing, um, doing good in the world. His intention is not to mitigate harm, but to actually do good. So we'll work towards that. Thank you very much. Agriculture, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. And uh, now we're going to make a bit of a switch on the stage. And I'd like to ask uh, Abra and Philip and Phil Ferrero and Josh and Leanne to come to the, to the stage. Okay, and if you want. So there's a 
I would move around here more so I can actually see. Where can I see you all from? You, you can't move back anymore. You might fall off. No, I'm, I'm good here. Philip, Abra. Oh, so we we don't have we don't have Philip. Or, um, sorry, um, Phil Ferrero. Okay, all right. So this um, the, the what was that that you just said to me, Bob? The the regional the regional network. Okay. This is a discussion about the potential for uh, an Atlantic Ca Canadian food network. So you haven't met Abra yet, and I will give you a tiny taste of, uh, Abra is a, a nationally respected policy and analyst and sustainable food systems advocate. She has been involved in community-based food systems work most of her life. With a background in agriculture, she be began integrating indigenous food systems and sustainable fisheries into her work in 2006. She works throughout BC and Canada as an advisor, analyst, and mentor. And she's a friend of mine, and she's here in Nova Scotia right now. <laughs> <laughs> And I won't introduce Philip. Thank you again for what you brought to us. Uh, Josh is the CEO of Food First Newfoundland. Um, the, it's an, a provincial nonprofit organization that works with communities in Newfoundland and Labrador to ensure everyone has access to affordable, healthy, and culturally appropriate food. He's pas passionate about system change and the power of collective action, and he's taken a lead role in many coalitions and campaigns. He co-chairs the Provincial Food Security Working Group with the government of Newfoundland and sits on the province's health accord task force. Welcome. Were we supposed to be worried that you might not make it in the end? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not quite, like, I've got a little, a few more weeks. <laughs> Leanne Prescott has worked in the nonprofit sector for over 15 years, specializing in equipping and empowering people and teams to make their impact for social good. It was a passion for food access and food security that motivated her to pursue, pursue work in this sector. Before founding Line Rock Company, where she is the principal consultant, Leanne worked for eight years in the humanitarian sector, supporting public engagement, community development, and advocacy for World Vision Canada. Um, she is now working with the Food for All New, uh, New Brunswick, that is a connected, informed, uh, and she's in connected, informed, and engaged in food security for all. Food for All New Brunswick provides leadership in the advancement of food security in New Brunswick through networking, knowledge, and information sharing, public relations, and building partnerships. So welcome all of you, and and um, this is this is a free range conversation. 
where you will each build off of your uh, knowledge within your particular spheres to figure out how we can work together to do this better. Build, a, build another causeway, maybe? <laughs> Josh. Sure, I'll, uh, I can start. I think uh, it's, you pretty much just asked us to like cover the entire topic of the conference of the next three days. So I'm just <laughs> saying, lower your expectations, people. Uh, <laughs> But I, I do think this is maybe a good conversation to have as we're starting these couple of days together. Um, you know, why why is there potential in this room and in this region? And it's something that, like, myself and our team, we've been thinking a lot about. Uh, a lot of us in this room have been talking on a lot of Zoom calls for the last few years. Um, and I'll actually say, just starting right off, I think that's one thing that has happened because we were all forced into our little Brady Bunch boxes for 24 months, it has dropped that initial barrier. There's many people in this room who know each other better because it was easy enough for us to hop on and chat with each other, uh, it, you know, and it made a difference. I think we do, uh, we're already seeing some of the benefits of those connections being made between people in a way that did, just didn't exist in the same way three years ago. We still knew each other. Um, so we had, like, I think there's something, A, to, to, to jump off of there. I also think, and there's, there's just so much that we all share in terms of both, like, the challenges we're facing. So, you know, coming into this room, we're from the Atlantic provinces. We have historically and typically the highest rates of food insecurity in the country. It's usually, we're kind of trading it off between our different provinces in this room, by and large, unfortunately, right? And that's certainly true now. Same with, you know, new data on childhood food insecurity. It's about one in one in four. We have the dubious distinction of having the highest rate in the country, but that's only by a smidge, like a half a percent above, uh, you know, other Atlantic provinces. So we're, we're, we also face the, I think, the, the challenge with, a shared urgency maybe. So there's something something to that. Uh, and I, I, there's something, we all do our work in the context of the Atlantic Canada where our networks are small enough for good or for ill, right? We all know each other. Um, you know, there's, we can talk lots about that. I'm sure we will this weekend, but I do think, you know, people are learning how to, and have, have been learning how to take advantage of that and build something really creative. Like if, if anywhere in Canada has a basic income in the next two years, two years, it's going to be, or three years, or five years, whatever, it's going to be in Atlantic Canada. It'll be, and that's really something, right? That we've we've built that, and that seems realistic now. Uh, and that, and there are a lot of people in this room have helped make that happen. And one of the reasons is that the the barriers to doing things differently, I actually think, are a little bit lower here than they could be anywhere else. So that's some initial thoughts. <laughs> the end. I think so definitely we've seen um, some steps going moving towards working collaboratively in our four provinces. I think um, with the even with COVID and the, the the blockades at the borders sort of like helped us to recognize that we do have we, we hadn't in a lot of ways we hadn't really recognized that we were in four different provinces, but and suddenly it became so much more apparent that we were. And so um, we definitely need a way when we're talking about our food systems, because we're hanging out here on the edge of Canada, and we're, you know, a few more than two million people in uh, two time zones in four provinces, where we've, we've got, um, we've got a great opportunity to be able to understand each other's social context, the challenges of feeling somewhat isolated and somewhat removed from other parts of the, the greater national food system. Um, and so when we are, I think, in our own areas and we're just sort of focused on our just just our little piece of all of the Atlantic Canada, it can feel very overwhelming. Um, it can feel very isolated and alone, but there's so many of us facing a lot of the same obstacles and a lot of the same challenges. So in my time working at Food for All, I've seen a lot of awesome resource sharing that's happening. People, um, once that, I mean, Atlantic Canadians, we are fantastic at um, being hospitable and being welcoming and willing to share. So uh, what I've, I've seen a lot of 
that once we realize that somebody else is doing something similar to what we want to be doing, um, we are not shy about asking for the help. And we're not shy about giving that help. So um, if we have a nice, clear channel, a centralized place where we can gather and talk about our food work, um, and we can start to collaborate and work together on things that are affecting all four provinces. Um, I think that that's, I think it's, it's become really obvious it's needed and it's started to build. And I think even evidence that this conference is happening, that this is like all, that we're represent, representatives from all four provinces are here and we wanna learn together and then we wanna have these conversations about how we work better together. I think uh, Philip gave us some indications when he showed us that map of New England. Yeah, and um, you know, I think things that I've seen that, that feel like they've been effective is um, not just aggregating small successes, but celebrating those together is, is really important. And you know, the flip side of that coin is avoiding large failures. You know, just as sometimes we, we get so grandiose and that's okay to be kind of aggressive and thought you know ambitious in the vision and but we've got to remember to to celebrate those small successes together mm -hmm. um i'm a big fan of june holly I, I didn't really get to mention um you know folks in athens ohio which some folks say is the most mature local food system in the united states at about 40 years um, but a really interesting place. And June Holly has done such a great job with social network analysis and really, you know, having people groups take the time to kind of look at all the different possible players, like the REAMP model that I mentioned. Um, and just, you know, because there, there are fits there that you wouldn't think would, would be there sometimes. Um, and then again, sort of the flip side of that is, um, you know, the, the research is really important and the white papers are important, but turn those into other things. Um, you know, turn them into story maps, turn them into celebrations, turn them into art, you know, whenever you can, um, because you just got to raise it up when you're small and mighty. You got to have the chance to really appreciate the beauty of it all, too. Abra, you've been looking at <clears throat> these issues from a Canada wide perspective. So, Curious to hear your thoughts. So I have to confess, I'm from away. I'm from the other end of Canada. But I feel like I have a lot, um, a certain level of empathy with the dynamics here in the Atlantic provinces because I, I do work nationally and I've, for the last two and a half years, I've been sitting on a national committee working on climate um, policy. And I listen to my colleagues repeatedly say, well, out west, blah, 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 blah. And they're clearly talking about west to the Rockies. Canada stops at Alberta. I don't know what British Columbia, what country it belongs to, but it's never a part of the national dialogue and it's infuriating. And we are also like the Atlantic provinces. Um, we are hampered by having far too many of those pokey up things called mountains. And it means we have very, very little agricultural um, productivity cap uh, possible in the, in the province because it's too vertical. And so um, the challenges of trying to piece back together food systems when you are necessarily limited to small scale. There's a cue if you ever got one. <laughs> yeah. um, Sorry. That's okay. So, I mean, I've been doing this for a really long time. I've been hanging out with farmers for a really long time. And I am the offspring of farmers. I grew up in a farm. And I think that as a result of all of that, I have a fairly, I have a fairly strong di uh, pragmatic uh, approach to food systems. But I also really have a big heart and a passion for understanding what's there and keeping it going. Because it's so... Frankly, it's infuriating. And like 15 years ago, I'm from BC where the 100 mile diet was born. And 
I watched it explode and all these people run around and they go to the farmer's market and they buy five bucks worth of veggies and they think they're saving the world. And I wanted to write a blog called The Grumpy Locavore. <laughs> <laughs> it was just so infuriating that these very tokenist approaches to what really needs to happen in our food systems um, was making people feel smug and like they were done. And it is not done. And those farmers, like the amount of work, how many farmers are in this room? That's so, thank you for coming. And what about fishers? We are in the Atlantic provinces. Yeah. We need fishers. Yeah. So for me, part of the trick about rebuilding our food systems is recognizing what's there, what's in front of us, understanding what their needs are, and busting our butts to figure out how to keep them in business, really listening carefully to, to knowing what are their barriers, and then finding the synergies, putting our money where our mouth is, and overcoming stupid bureaucratic barriers. So... I'm really thrilled to hear about the institutional procurement piece here in um, this region, but I really want to, I'd like to know a heck of a lot more about it because in our NBC, and I'm sorry, you can always get the shepherd's hook out and get me to stop if you need, but there was an initiative to have um, the, the local health authority, which covers a huge swath of BC, wanted to look at um, sourcing local food. And so someone told them to call me. And, and the person didn't engage me with, with me at all. And what I tried to help her understand is, if you're looking at a range of the services that health uh, providers give, there's a small fraction of what they're doing is being provided to people who are at high risk. And so those people, like if they're, they're struggling with cancer or whatever, yes, go way overboard with making sure that food is safe. But to, to re require at the farm level ridiculous food security requirements that have bureaucratic and institutional requirements for something that's going to be cooked, for heaven's sakes, it's not going to be, it's not a, a source of foodborne illness if you properly cook your meat, your potatoes, your carrots, your onions. So for the institutional procurement, we have to make sure that we bring common sense, which is what I've heard over and over and over again from farmers. is like, let's bring some common sense into this conversation. Make sure that you're not requiring HACCP, GAP, any other ridiculous bureaucratic system to the small scale producers while still enabling their food to feed local food and help local people and help nourish their nourish them back to health. So some of you may have noticed the color of my hair. Um, so I can tell you that back in the 60s in Nova Scotia, we, including uh, the farm I grew up on, we were producing about 60% of the food that was uh, consumed here in Nova Scotia. And at that time, there were about 700 and some thousand people here. We could do it then. Thanks to big corporations, we are not doing it now. Thanks to uh, I always like sellers, except for this. The lowest price is the law. Well, I'm sorry, the lowest price should not be the law when we are talking about our health, when we are talking about our economy, when we are talking about the fact that, that we've seen, just had a conversation about the fishery, Abra, um, we've seen uh, communities wither away. Now, things are changing right now, and we're seeing a resurgence, and we're all doing the best we can to, to literally seed and feed that resurgence. But I think that if we all across the Atlantic province are, are looking at 
how we can continue to collaborate, how in some cases, for example, I've been asked to um, help with a CEDAR program in other program in other provinces, how we can work together to ensure that when those boats don't go across the street, uh, that there is food there. I actually attended a, a session in Newfoundland probably 10 years ago, eight, 10 years ago, um, and there were 170 farmers there at that session. So there's there's about 5%, uh, sorry, about, about um, what is it, 5% local? That is a very... That, uh, that's a highly debated number, somewhere between 10 and 20 probably. Okay, yeah. so that's, yeah. which is not dissimilar here. So working together and continuing and, and thanks to this uh, Food Summit for bringing some of us together because actually it's quite nice to see you in three dimensions, by the way. <laughs> and by the way, I think there's some Newfoundland screech back there. <laughs> <laughs> So um, each of you put together for us your one or two item wish list. I'll start with you, Josh. Yeah, sure. I mean, I have, I have one. I, and thinking about this question about like localizing our, our food systems, I kind of wish that we have can could really think through not even so much what the climate crisis is going to mean for this conversation, but actually even in the shorter term, um, what the things we're trying to do to deal with the climate crisis are going to mean for this situation. So like we haven't really had that solid of a conversation out our way in, let's say, for example, at a couple of years from now, Canada got really serious about actually meeting all these goals that we've set ourselves. We, uh, what would that actually mean to our food system? And I think it would push us in the direction of rethinking some of those relationships and relocalizing. We're, I don't think we're not going to rebuild the food system of the 1960s or the 1930s. It's going to be really, it's going to be different. Uh, but it has to be one that responds to the reality that's coming. And right now, I like what I my wish is that we did, pulled our heads out of the sand, to be honest with you, as a as society. That's probably the, the like the, the number one wish. And then the like the, the number two one here is that that everyone has what they need to participate in that food system, right? Like that we we can't have the conversation around what we produce uh, without having the conversation about how people how people can access it, right? And 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 I do think that like Atlantic Canada is in the forefront of, of that in, in, in the country, and that's something we can build on. So, you know, yeah, in a dream world, a few years from now, we take climate change seriously, and we have a basic income that lets everybody eat the food that makes sense for them, I think we could be there, right? Um, so, in thinking about uh, as we were planning and preparing for this conference, we did a lot of thinking about um, what will be happening after, what, what comes next. And so um, my first wish list item is a little bit like more immediate in that um, as we're going through the sessions and, um, tomorrow and on Saturday, that we will be thinking, how does this, how could this be implemented um, in all four provinces, how could we work better together to take some of these key things that we're learning and and make a, a food system that's going to work um, for us here in Atlantic Canada? Um, we have also, I'm thinking about, you know, we have, we do have a uh, a school food problem. We have a lot of hungry bellies. Um, COVID exacerbated it. It re revealed that we have a bigger problem than we realize. Um, the numbers that we're seeing of people needing access to, that don't have access to food immediately, they can't grow their own food, they can't access it, they can't travel to get to it. They, um, you know, we're seeing that they're just watching those numbers climb and the projections are pretty scary. Um, so 
I mean, it, let's let's talk about how we can uh, come up with some solutions there. And I'm also thinking about, you know, we do have the opportunity of us coming from four different provinces together is our is our influence. Um, we have an opportunity to bring, you know, to, to share our ideas, but also to come up with some recommendations and apply some pressure because I think. I think we've seen that sometimes we can say, oh, well, you know, Nova Scotia figured this out. So let's put some pressure on New Brunswick and PEI to get, to get them to figure it out or like, oh, check out what Newfoundland is doing. And so I think we can sort of apply some pressure as a large group, um, endorsing some recommendations and, and putting some things forward. Um, and I also think that we have like a, a food processing problem. We're sending a lot of food away um, that, you know, there's maybe there's a way that we can in our four provinces work together to get some of the processing done here in, in our area and uh, see some of our food stay closer to home. It's like a trick question because the U.S. has a terrible history of wishing things for other places and then, <laughs> and then acting on it. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, it, th there is one thing that's come to mind. It was the conversation with you, Abra, and then Bob, and I think maybe Joe was on the phone a couple weeks ago. Is um, One of the things that I haven't seen in the United States, but I also I don't have enough knowledge of what's happening um, with a lot of the Native American groups um, in the on the west side of the country. But working with groups kind of along the Appalachian spine. So I, I think what happens very often with food systems work, um, I, I guess I'll go ahead and say this. So one of the things that worried me as, as food systems became a discipline, an academic discipline, was that it gave us as academics an opportunity to wash our hands of the soil, of the dirtiness, of, to step back in a way a little bit and just not really be involved in the nitty gritty. And um, I think a little bit of that's happened. I, there's been more good than not. Um, but one of the things that I think also happens kind of in working with groups, um, especially on the East Coast of the United States, is it's very easy given where a lot of us who come from the food systems arena, whatever that means, NGOs or agencies or academics, um, you know, we, we, we come in with an attitude where we miss things. And one of the things that I was hoping I would happen in my home state of North Carolina was that the hunting and fishing piece would be embraced more in the discussions and be a real part because it was for my family's home in West Virginia, that that's what got people by. You know, and, and so my wish would be that you all do things differently from what I've seen in a lot of other places where you're able to em embrace that and just the drive. I think when Joe Mike was talking about coming from one direction, I think I came from three directions to get here, but um, <laughs> you know, just in that convoluted drive, it um, you know, sometimes agriculture itself doesn't fit. It's not, it's it's not the food system. So I'm really eager to hear what you have to say tomorrow. Abra about this as well, and because that's been a missing piece. And I, I'm trying not to use the word classist, and I don't know what the right word is, but you know, between the hunting, the fishing, the indigenous cultures, there's just an opportunity to do something. And the maritime provinces and, and fisheries, yeah, it, it could be really cool. And it should be, it should be what it is. It should reflect what's there. So you're so lucky to be where you are, it seems. So Phil's stealing my thunder again. <laughs> um, when I think about, I, I've, I've only been to two, three of the Atlantic provinces and haven't spent a lot of time here. But I've, everywhere I go, I really look at the landscape and try and wrap my head around how it works and what the soil's like and what the, you know, what the weather is like and the impact that has on everything that lives there. And um, but I'm also, I've just started an interdisciplinary PhD at Dalhousie University, and I want to look at Indigenous food sovereignty, 
because in the last um, number of years, I've really tried to reckon with my role as a settler Canadian. And I really think that particularly in this part of the country and also in my part of the country where the land was never ceded. I think for us, in, if we're looking at just food, if we're looking at justice, we really need to reckon with the fact that we're all squatters. And so what does that mean in terms of, you know, honoring the truth, uh, the um, peace and friendship treaty? looking at the two row wampum treaties. What does it mean to coexist in some way that actually recognizes the people that lived here first and that we've done so much harm to? So I'm gonna speak about that a bit tomorrow morning in my, in my talk, but um, on a totally different note, um, one of my wish lists for food systems, and I apologize to the fishery oriented people, um, and maybe there's a need there too, but I would love to see agriculture be included in the federally uh, run apprenticeship programs. So you've got four years of classwork, hands-on training, pro like all kinds of funding programs, the whole wraparound to train up someone over four years to be a farmer, because there's far too many farmers, wannabe farmers, who are really great on social media and they do a season or two and woohoo, and then you never see them again. It's really hard work to, to do food for a living, whether you're a fisher or a farmer or even any up the supply chain. And so having people have the supports that enable them to stay in it long enough that they can help us rebuild our food system, I think that's really vital. And now you're gonna get my two cents worth. We have been um, using food um, to fill our guts without filling our hearts and souls. We have been eating highly processed food, which is costing us our health, costing the health of, of children, of people in need. Um, 50, almost 50% 50 of Nova Scotia's health, our budget goes to health repair. It's about time that we decrease that 50% of a highly processed that's not supporting our communities and, and putting that money into all of the appropriate aspects of, of our economy, our environment, our health, um, our children's futures, the, the, the strength of who we should be. And so I, I ask everybody to think about health. Think about the people who might not be on the street in Halifax or, or other cities, if maybe they'd had better food throughout their lives. Think about the things that food is meant to be. It's, our, it's the foundation of who we are. And if we devalue it, if we don't put our energy back into better food for everyone, then, then um, we're, we're, not do, we're not doing it. Those of us here, we can do it. We are doing it. But, but add those little provisos to it and, and keep, keep health, keep the economy, keep community in mind. So last, last comment from any one of you. <laughs> it's time to dig in. <laughs> thank, you. thank you all very much. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Uh, it was actually a question that I thought of, uh, Philip, when you were talking. Um, and you were talking about uh, the, uh, the shift towards uh, pesticide-free uh, towns in Italy. Um, I am a, a, a very new farmer. I, I have entered farming through inheritance. I 
Uh, I'm two years in and a beekeeper and a fruit farmer and vegetable farmer and I have animals and, and I'm, I've jumped into it with three kids by myself and I love it. And I have the gift of being on a farm that has 40 years of uh, not seen any pesticides. Uh, my dad uh, has, has developed this uh, farmstead um, with very little um, unnatural interference, um, which I'm very grateful for. Um, and so for me, pesticides has sort of been like a, a very distant thought. I'm actually on the edge of a farming belt. So I'm quite far from any big farmers who I might feel the, the effects of their pesticides. Um, and one of the things that uh, when you were talking about this, like, again, I, I, I think of myself being very unaffected by pesticides. Um, but I, I happened to see something on Facebook the other day that was on a farm, uh, uh, sorry, a hunting feed um, that talked about the herbicides being used in forestry. Uh, in here in Nova Scotia, one of the crops that we forget about a lot of the time is uh, that forestry is actually one of our biggest crops. Um, and I think in agriculture, we, we separate ourselves from forestry being, being a crop, you know, there's the forestry crop and then there's the agricultural crops. Um, and and this, uh, this comment on Facebook was about how hunters should be wary of where the gliophosphate is being sprayed because the deer will go into areas where gliophosphate is sprayed and will ingest plants from, um, from those areas and then will wander long, long distances and then you're, you're shooting deer and uh, ingesting deer that now has high levels of toxins in it. Um, so my, my question that I wanted to throw out there uh, for people in the agricultural industry, is there any thought about how, especially here in Nova Scotia and, and definitely probably in New Brunswick as well, how the forestry herbicides industry potentially is having an effect on the agricultural industry? <laughs> <laughs> that I got involved in food politics in the early mid 90s um, when they started introducing um, biotech, but also because I was hanging out with a bunch of organic farmers and they felt powerless about pesticides being sprayed in the forests around their farms. And it's a huge issue, probably all across the continent. And I think unless we actually make noise and try and push our political leaders into actually doing something, it's not gonna happen. It really does take a heck of a lot of effort and it is ultimately a policy change that we need there. I mean, I would just, say that I, I think one of the things we need to do everywhere is um, draw more of the medical community into the, the food system con conversations, not just conversations, but for whatever reason, just the, the distance that's been had between the medical community and, you know, heard someone mentioned dietitians, you know, dietitians, the more they understand what's, what's happening, I think that starts to have a positive impact. But just there, there's so much science out there. If you're looking at the meta-analyses that are there, I mean, you know, some, so often the industry picks off one, one thing. And in some cases, one of the questions that you have to address too is, do you choose one pesticide um, or do you just tackle the issue of synthetic pesticides overall? Because, you know, it's the flywheel effect. Every time you get rid of one, there's one coming right in behind it. And so sometimes you need the token, um, but it's not the reality either. Um, it's just there's so much that's out there that needs to be addressed. But it's interesting. Really it is interesting further down the road for many farmers. <clears throat> but no doubt you're hearing about regenerative farming and that is absolutely crucial to our future that we do it right. Anybody? 
I'm, I was just going to say, oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> There was just one framing I really like around this conversation that you were just saying, Philip. Um, so the the doctor who chaired our health accord process in, in our province, which was like, give us a ten year plan to fix healthcare, and it turned into a ten year plan to fix health. Right, it's a very different different thing. Uh, and you know, one of the things he liked to say around this table was that we have one minister of health but every minister is a minister for health, right? So you have like the minister of forestry, the minister of transportation, all these portfolios, they have health impacts to their work and they don't see yep. it, right? There's no, there's nothing built into those structures to incentivize people to think about the health implications of their decisions. And maybe that could change. So I just, I really like that framing. It's like changed my, my way of thinking a lot. And so I think in, in this context, you know, the people managing our forests are exactly that, right? Good, thank you. I've got the mic, so I'm gonna speak. <laughs> okay, I've been told one more question. I wanted to say that the key difference that we're talking about here is a difference between symbolic action and strategic action. And that's the difference that several of you have pointed to. And that's what you were just talking about, Josh. For years, the environmental movement, and I've been part of that for half a century, has patted ourselves on the back for protesting and for winning minor battles while the planet has gone down the tubes. The time for that is past. And when it comes to herbicides or when it comes to agriculture or when it comes to public health, we need to connect the dots and develop blanket strategic approaches and they need to be backed up politically and economically to be effective. Thank you very much, folks. We'll be continuing these conversations. <laughs>